now it's my pleasure to introduce Ruth Erickson. Um, due to the weather, she was supposed to be here at 1.30. Uh, she got in at 5. So she just arrived into uh, Charles this morning. So really glad she could make it. Um, Ruth's going to be talking about um, kind of the career we can learn. She has known him and has worked for quite a while. So she's going to kind of put um, the work that you see in this exhibit into context of what he's done for his career. Uh, Ruth is an art historian and a curator. She is a PhD candidate, candidate in the history of art at the University of Pennsylvania and a research fellow at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. The research focuses on 20th century art, the specific interest in video, film, social art practices, and pedagogy. From 2004 to 2007, she was a curator at the ECA Center in Burlington, Vermont, where she organized over she does have with uh, exhibitions. So um, help me welcome Ruth to Charleston. Ideas and emotions that you 
these were hung on the wall um, in a kind of installation piece. But they're sort of a taxonomy or a, you know, a collection of these, almost in some ways, their, their patina and the way that he's colored them and kind of distressed them makes them look like they're found archaeological objects. But in fact, they're entirely of his creation. So when he's coming out of graduate school, I would say that sculpture here, which is he's first touched on here, and drawing, which he touched on in the last work, are the two things that he really carries forward through graduate school. He stops painting, and out of graduate school, makes objects and draws um, as sort of in developing his practice. So this was the show that I did with Ethan, um, with Ethan in 2006 at the BCA Center. And I want to use this, this, this show, or really the, the series that Ethan did for the show, to sort of talk about what Ethan developed as his mature practice, which is the one that's carried through in this show and it's carried through in subsequent shows as well. I think that when there's some artists who uh, have worked on a series and then work on a drastically different series next, I'm thinking of somebody like Damien first, you know, who stops a shark and then does dot paintings and then does something entirely different. There's these like ruptures. And I think there are other artists, and I think Ethan falls in this category, where project upon project, he's taking ideas, and there's a continuity and a sort of progressive nature to the way that Ethan works. And I think that what you can see as you're tracing these projects is him learning and learning how to do things, but then he integrates into the next project. And then he builds upon that idea in the next project. Um, and, I, and so it's, it's sort of great to be able, for me to be able to look back to Ethan's work and really see how this show pulls together a lot of what he's done previously. So this is um, the Pinto Brothers. Um, this is the Pinto Brother drawings, the anti-right brothers misadventure. So Ethan, um, it's through this project that Ethan really developed the process that he uses to make his work. And that process always begins, or especially at the beginning, began always with a narrative. And Ethan spends a lot of time doing research and reading and writing and thinking about the narrative upon which he's going to then subsequently base the work. This narrative, um, oh, and I, I'd like to mention here, if you don't already know, that Ethan's grandfather was the important American broadcaster, Edward R. Murrow, who worked for CBS. Um, he became well known for his reports about World War II. He also became very well known for his coverage of um, Senator Joseph McCarthy, that led in part to McCarthy's uh, censure. So, in some ways, I always think that Ethan has in his, you know, in his bones, in his DNA, this both desire, this almost journalistic and investigative desire into American history and American politics. And I think that you see that in the ways in which he develops his narratives. Project. So in the case of the Pinto brothers, this is a tale of nine brothers and their attempts to get airborne and to capture flowers. So right there you see the sort of this Ethan loves characters that are have these wild ideas, they work tirelessly and doggedly toward these ideas that are doomed to fail. These ideas that have built into their structure something that's impossible. And I think that he sees in this in, this, in, that, in that sense, in that character, something that's both uh, incredibly American and something he relates back to himself um, is this sort of doomed to failure. So this, these are nine brothers, are part of the Pinto Brothers in the whole series. Um, there's Octave, the math expert. There's Langley, who's the guinea pig who flies into the atmosphere on a jet pack. And there's Huckabur, the publicity hound. So they each have these characters. He develops these biographies, these images around each of these characters. Um, and this was loosely inspired, as he says, the anti-Wright brothers in this adventure, loosely inspired by his own reading of the Wright brothers and his interest in that history. So after he comes up with a general sense of the narrative, a sense of his characters, what their, what their personality is like, then he starts to create a story for and in his story storyboard, he's going to you know, establish the basic narrative steps and progress of the story. Um, and he actually oftentimes will draw this out and sketch it out just like you would for a film. Um, so to create the way, you know, the possible uh, props that he's going to need, the mise en scène, the setting that he, might, he envisions, uh, the different characters and the steps of the narrative. After he establishes the storyboard, and I think this is just incredible in how it captures, um, he says, at the moment of launch, the quick release jam, and Huffaker lost his clue. So 
you can also, the titles for Ethan's work are always incredibly important to leading the steps into the narrative. So the titles often sort of reveal the narrative moment which she's trying to capture. And here, I love how he has these four separate characters all captured at this moment in these incredibly different poses. Um, so it's sort of, I think that their bodies really capture the way in which each of these characters is responding to the failure of the first launch attempt for the Pinto brothers. So he's established the um, narrative, the storyboard. The next piece are the props and the costumes. And this is really where that work in sculpture in graduate school comes back. Even everything you see here, Ethan has imagined, he's gone to yard sales to collect the pieces in his studio, he's put together, you know, bowls and straps and belts and tape, and he has created these costumes from things that he's sourced. And I think that the props um, are, it's a, it's a sculpture practice, and it's, a, it, it's always very important that props are these kind of incredible things that you look like you could have made at home with the things that you have lying around. But, you know, and which is definitely what the, the image that he wants to convey, but one would never make these things at home, which are totally bizarre looking. So this is the pilot, the third attempt to descend. And I love that he has this, some kind of tube in his mouth, you know, like, as if he's blowing or sucking or, you know, what would he be wearing with a jetpack with this tube in his mouth? Giving the jetpack oxygen, perhaps? But just that little gesture, kind of, and what it, points to about the absurdity of the action being depicted. Um, during this phase of building the props, setting up the costumes, he's also scouting locations. So at the time when Ethan made this, he was living in Seattle with his wife, Vita Weinstein, who's a collaborator, a regular collaborator of Ethan's. So we'll see a picture of her later. And um, this series was on the coast in Seattle. They did this on the coast in Seattle. And it happened over about five, the, um, the, sh the performance part of this, um, which is where Ethan, you know, just imagine the scene for a minute. Ethan has a duffel bag full of these props, probably many bags, full of these props, full of these costumes. He plays all of the characters. He goes out to the coast in Seattle. He puts on these outfits, you know, when he's Lilith Fall or when he's Huffaker or when he's Octave, he subsumes that character and he acts out the elements from his storyboard himself for the camera that his wife was holding um, and shooting him doing his performance. So this kind of, you know, I mean, if you, were, if you saw this scene, if you are walking on the beach, you'd probably think, who is this crazy person? <laughs> um, but also this really intimate collaboration between them where, you know, it's just the two of them out on the beach. And he told me when we did the show that it was just awful wet. It was raining like it was today. One weekend, we even had a hailstorm. And so he felt even more um, absurd and dogged like his own characters in his desire to keep creating these performances, to keep you know, attempting to create this narrative, even despite these kind of terrible uh, conditions. So here is Lilenthal's curiosity, curiously incorrect meteorological predictions made him the primary scapegoat. So again, you get the brothers are blaming who's responsible for the failed launch attempt. And it's because of this one gentleman failing to have a meteorological prediction. Something that then also relates back to Ethan's own performance, Ethan's own making of the work because of the rain and the hail, the thing he was having during it. Uh, Rick? Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the, the scale of these drawings? Yeah. So this um, drawing, I, don't, I didn't get the um, dimensions on here, but this drawing is probably eight to 10 feet wide. Um, massive, massive drawings. You can kind of see the scale here in the gallery. Um, you know, this is a, these are 12 foot ceilings or 14 foot ceilings. So they're, yeah, really, really large scale drawings. Um, not all of them always are, but in general, he works, and especially at this time, he works in this kind of large scale. Uh, and then the last part actually is the drawing. So he's gone out, he's done these performances for the camera, for still camera, as well as for movie camera. This Pinto Brothers project was the first project he did of made film while he was doing the performance. And that has become something that's been very important in his work. So in this film, um, and in the back of the gallery for the show that I did, we actually showed the film in two screens of, you know, these edited together pictures of Ethan, always 
as the character of one of the brothers going out and doing this crazy thing. And then the images, the drawings, are based on stills from the film. Um, but for instance, in this case, he's taking four stills from the film, and he's pieced them together to create this, this kind of slew of these images of these different characters. Since he's playing all of the characters, this enables him to have multiple figures in the same, uh, in the same composition. And I just want to draw attention to these poses and the way that he is able to capture in these poses and these gestures so much about these people. I mean, the second figure from the left, where he's throwing his hat down because he's angry, I mean, these are poses that come directly out of, I think, Ethan's study of people, but then Ethan's also study of cinema and his own you know, interest in acting and performance in cinema. Or I love this gesture in the center of just like you know, looking up at the sky, like, um, so really, it just captures, I think, so well these different characters. Again, it's all of them. This is the last one I'll show um, of this series. Hopper and Lilithal dispute over publicity issues. Causes them to miss the launch entirely. <laughs> and I, you know, if anybody has siblings, you can just imagine this, that the two brothers are fighting and then they miss entirely the, the, the successful launch that I took. And again, my master returned to the fact that they're collecting clouds. And so the entire drama and the experiences and the interactions of it are based upon this kind of absurd idea that they're going to go try and collect the clouds, something that you can't, can't collect. The next project uh, I want to talk about is his dust, mine, dust mining drawings, a community who believes dust is a valuable resource. Um, so this is a similar to Ethan really sets out the, uh, the footprint for what, how he's going to go about building his projects for a number of years. And so the Dust Money's projects works um, through that same model. This is the part, this is a very early Dust drawing where he's developing these characters. These are his friends uh, at the time in Vermont. That they, you know, having his friends come in, dressing them in these costumes, posing them against the wall, taking their pictures, and then building these, these, this family is one of the key families that's going to begin his narrative of these dust miners. This is, a, this is called the Herber family, dust pioneers. So the idea of the dust miners, it's, you know, it's like an itinerant share, sharecropper of the first part of the century, or the itinerant fruit pickers that still work a lot in the United States. And this is a group of people that live in these ramshackle camps um, with their families, and they mine dust. And of course, mining dust, like catching clouds, is a totally absurd and hilarious proposal that one in the, perhaps the most, I mean, the most dusty activity of all mining, that one would try and capture what is pure dust and what is impure dust, or the idea that dust could be commodified, the dust that we all loathe in our houses and wipe up, that here it's becoming a commodity and something that's actually being sold on the market. So there's these incredibly imaginative narratives that also in some ways point back to I think things that are are very much you know contemporary political issues. What's being commodified, what's not, who controls it, um, how are the people who do a lot of the extraction of some of these things treated or not treated. Uh, so even though they're very imaginative, I think that they have a lot to do with uh, contemporary politics as well. This is my favorite work from the series. I think this is just an absolutely gorgeous. Um, drawing and composition. It's called A Beautiful View of the Dust Market as wealthy miner Thatcher Walman arrives with her train. And this is the first picture we have here of Vina. This is his wife in the foreground, Vina. Um, and this is a depiction of a market scene of the dust. People who are coming to then sell their dust. And you can see that in the scale in the center, they put it into these balls so that it can be weighed and commodified. Again, like the impossibility of being able to put dust into something like that. And there's 100% pure dust that's everywhere. And these people, they, they, there's a lot of talk about what's pure and what's impure dust, um, you know, as if that could be determined. So this is, um, Ethan had a really great uh, opportunity with this when he was making this project. He made early storyboard, he developed some of the narrative here. And he then got in touch with Harvest Films. And they really loved the idea and loved the narrative and said that we had made a philanthropic gesture and said that we really want to help you make a really professional film um, out of this, this dust mining people. And so through the general 
generosity of so many people, they were able to get these costumes together. This is out in Scrubland, um, just in the northeast of LA. And they worked with you know, actors, filmmakers, TNT techs, they did these explosions, medical staff, PAs, truck drivers, even gave me this list. There were just so many people that helped. Almost all of them donated their time to make a film um, called Dust Planning. And I believe you guys remember the screen this film here. It's an amazing film. It won awards at film festivals. It's a really, really great film about these people that started this uh, story work. This is just a shot of the um, background shot of the film. So each of these backpacks, these miners' backpacks here, you can see there's like this funny kind of weird circuit board looking thing on them and these ropes and then they all have this uh, this arm, like a desk lamp that comes over the top of them that lights their way. And you can see in the film that they'll be holding up this uh, tweezer, you know, with nothing in it and dust. And then they're looking with the light and looking if it's pure dust or not. And then putting it in these tiniest little vials so it's just a, a, it's a really great film. This is another picture of the shooting of this. <laughs> this character, this character with all the ropes um, wrapped around him is kind of a, um, sort of a, he's kind of an overseer character. And he's the one who will pay people, like sharecroppers when they come and they bring their bus, bring the, to the poor miners. So there's just two shots of the film that I wanted to show you, but again, you'll get to uh, the actual film is in color as well, because they're just process shots. So after the film, after we make the film, Ethan goes back to do some drawings based again on some of the stills from the film, just to see them with the Pinto brothers. What I think is really interesting here is that you see this introduction of these framing devices, so that it looks as if this object is something that one that was produced at the time of the dust miners and by the dust miners, and it's something that has been found as a historical object. So he's complaining here, it's not, the, the drawing is no longer just a representation of a scene from the film, but the drawing has actually become as if it's a historical artifact of the dust people. Um, here, Latimer's handbook for the dust mines. You know, it looks like a page from an old book that might have been created to track the story of the dust mines. Uh, the, the hilarious um, title, the original title, Biblia Sacra, was too bold. But this tone is, is a necessity. So this tone kind of tracking the, the dust mine's history. And he uses this throughout. This is a beautiful picture of Rita, uh, his wife, who here it's being inserted as if it's a slide, as if it's a glass slide. So it's being inserted into a kind of slide carousel. Um, again, you know, entirely drawn, but here made so that the drawing references these prior historical objects. Document your poise, it helps hold in the investors. <laughs> this idea that the dust miners also take a lot of pictures of themselves, um, and this idea that they might be able to attract more investors to their business through this kind of self propaganda. Success is guaranteed. And this is an old stereo, this is made to look like an old stereoscope slide. Uh, the, you know, very popular 19th century slide where there would be two images taken from just a couple inches apart so that it created the, the way that our eyes look at things. And then they would be put into a stereoscope viewer and it would give you a sense of it as if it was uh, three-dimensional. But if you know about stereoscopes, you know that this would never work as a stereoscope because these are two different images. They're not an image of the, a picture of the same image. And so again, these are these polling this this structure, this format of the stereoscope, just as a way to reference back to a prior time, but in order to use it as a frame for this drawing. And to me, this looks like, uh, like, a, like a game, like double dutch or something. But if, like, look how many lines there are. And this boy seems to be suspended um, within this sort of set of ropes. And so you can never quite know, is this game or is this like training for young children to be able to become agile? Um, and I love the side how Ethan has drawn this in this kind of historical script, Dusters Publishers, as if that would have been also a publishing company that came out of Dust Mining. So just this very complex kind of architecture and infrastructure that Ethan builds around these stories. And I think 
children here. Some call it hyper hyperbole, but that is wrong. It is fact. So here, um, the expansionist, in its 131st year of production, a newspaper, um, and here talking about the dust miners um, with this, you know, classic kind of headline, unbelievable. And a picture, that's a still, that actually, you'll we'll see that in the film, that exact still, that's a still taken directly from the film. Um, and
with this crazy white, you know, wig of hair. Very A black eye from a banker at a banker's funeral was a sign of disrespect, but he stayed in the And you know, they're not, they're not clear what these are about, but they seem as if they're quite wise, and yet also quite stupid at once. And it's a funny way that wisdom and stupidity can be coupled, and we are so often coupled together, um, that I think also intrigues Ethan. And here, this work, you know, if anything needs to uh, express Ethan's virtuosity as a draftsman, look at the still life in the foreground. You know, it's like the best Netherlandish still life you might ever see with these eggs and grapes um, and potato. It's a really beautiful still life in this kind of Bacchus like uh, figure. But obviously, if you look into that, that character's eyes, there's madness to his eyes that I think is also captured. This is a next series that he did. He did this series for his first show um, that he had in Paris. And at the time, I was actually living in Paris, so I got to go and see this show at the Gallery for a few years. It's called Momentum House. And I think, for me, it really was a pretty important shift in Ethan's work that happened around this time. Um, because I think, whereas before, we can sort of trace out a narrative or a suggestion of a narrative through these characters, through these titles that are quite descriptive. Here, I think that this, the, the scenes and the images become a lot more surreal. And there was always a surrealism in the absurdity that was going through the fireworks, but this is a totally kind of unreal scene. One would not happen upon this scene. The scene is a pastiche where he's taken a lot of different elements and pieced it together here. Momentum House sort of loosely follows, you know, again, it's hard to make a narrative, but loosely follows this character that you see here with this funny, uh, funny hat and round glasses. The round glasses are the signal that it's the same character throughout. Follows him in engaging with these architectural spaces. But the architectural spaces are always kind of surreal spaces. So this architectural space opens up into an ocean scene. And this is called romance, and it seems to me like that lady is looking right at this guy. And there is a potential, potential of a kind of buddy romance that's happening within this through a drawn woman Nighttime in here. I think what's most interesting about this to me, what it makes me think of is like, where's in and where's out? Like, is he in the house or is he outside of the house? And nighttime in here, also to think of the way, like, as if night had happened in one, like, as if in one's head, like, there's a night that has fallen in his head, gesturing again to this madness. But then there's these stars, which you can't see as well in here, but um, it's a little bit. The contrast with the stars on top with like a whole solar system on top that he's drawn into this architectural space. The prisoners. Here I think this is a, um, this is like a curiosity cabinet that's been turned into a kaleidoscope. And you can see that he's shot through, there's this little circle that he's drawn in the preceding, and we got kind of a slice of the wood through it. And you can see these little circles as if he's created this oculus that he sees into it. But we can only imagine what he sees. And inside this structure, Ethan is embedded at the very top, um, a still from a Western film, you know, a zebra. It seems like a map. There's the, in the little circle here, there's a picture of cornrows, a landscape scene. So this all, using this structure, using this architectural structure as a way to kind of imagine this cabinet of curiosity. But then that same figure is moving to. It moved again. A number of works in this series plays with the idea that this man thinks that a drawing within the space is reality. So as if he's looking on that and thinks it's a mountain, there's another picture of him um, trying to catch seagulls, but you realize that the seagulls are actually the wallpaper in this house. So the way that these kind of representations within the house are, are becoming reality for this figure. What time is it? Okay, pardon? Five ten. Yeah. Five ten. Okay, great. Um, okay. So I am just gonna, this will be the last se older series I'll talk about, and I want to give you a hint of what he's been doing right now at this very moment. Um Doppler Doppelganger. Great, I don't know, words. Doppelganger is somebody that 
two bodies, that it, the Doppler effect is that you know, the sound changes as one moves closer between two bodies. So both of these words, Doppler and Doppelganger, deal with the relationship between two things, between two people. One is in sound, and one is upon likeness, or you know, similarity. And I think here again, it gets harder and harder exactly to piece together. The work in some ways becomes more idea-based or conceptual. The work is this um, space in which Ethan can test out and play with this idea that he's had, which is about doubleness and listening and maybe finding, trying to find one's double, trying to find one's doppelganger, trying to find the other body that creates the doppler effect. I love the scale playing this one, and as if this like enormous character is trying to hide in this stage. So I saw it when I saw this. This is alibi. Hollow knocking. Switch. It's like fight. I mean, it's a fight scene, but then the switch. Um, I think of the also like an electrical switch at this moment with a spark. Polyphonic. And I thought this would actually be in some ways a good place to end because I think it prefigures in some ways what he's interested in this show, which is aerial views and thinking about images of the landscape and people's relationships to those images of aerial landscapes. But before I go there, I want to give you a sneak peek of um, the flotilla that Ethan is in the midst of right now doing at the Dick Cordova Museum and Sculpture Park in Lincoln, Massachusetts, um, as part of their Dick Cordova Biennial. And uh, this is the scaffolding. He's literally drawn one book. He sent this to me yesterday. That's his progress. And I'm a bit worried for him because he has to, he's got 100 books to draw, a lot like these wall drawings. And we know that you know he's good and fast, but the idea of flotilla is that he would um, provide a map and an archive of American history through the boats that have been part of its history. Um, so for instance, he gave me the idea of he's going to draw the Mayflower, the, the 1620 Mayflower, obviously the thing that brought our first immigrants to these lands. And then he's interested in drawing a boat from the, um, the Cuban, the Mariel boat lift to the United States in 1980, which was a boat that was used, and then also a boat that was used um, for the U.S. invasion of Cuba in the Bay of Pigs in 1961. So kind of through these boats, tracing about how the U.S. has been made and remade by the immigrants that have come to its land in the boats. So these kind of unconnected things in American history that he wants to reconnect through this massive map and archive um, of boats. So that will hopefully, we'll cross our fingers, be done in two weeks. Um, so you're just saying, uh, like it's here drawing that it was about three times as big as what you did here in the space. I think that's three stories. It's uh, three stories high. Yeah. 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 So. Um, and then he's coming back here to do some more with us. <laughs> that's right. And he's coming back here to, to do another set on these drawings here. So I think then to these are the works that are that are in this show. Um, <clears throat> and now sort of hopefully having a sense of the context of what Ethan has been working on. 2002, since his graduate school days, I think that we can look to these works and see the ways in which portraiture is related here, the ways in which he is both referencing history, but referencing history as a, deal, as a way to deal with contemporary issues um, and contemporary politics. Um, and, and yeah, maybe, maybe we can talk more about these works in particular. Um, I think that's all there. Thanks, Ruth.
Actually, no, we're, we're doing some taping, so I'm going to do a little W. Yeah. Um, that middle set around 2010, 2010, in which he, there were self portraits, all figurative works, they seem very self reflexive, like he's watching himself, watching himself. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that's intentional. But, but he's, he's just curious about himself, his position in space. I mean, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to make a leap of faith here. Where, and what is he trying to do with that? Did I miss it? I mean, I understand the self-reflexive nature, but it's like, what for? Mm -hmm. I mean, is he even going there? He may not be going there because he's so whimsical. No, I think he is. I mean, I think in some ways, Nathan's whole project is self-reflexive. Because I think that in these characters that he develops, he's finding things not only that he finds in history or other characters from history, but things that he sees in himself. Um, so, you know, dysfunctions or frailties or obsessions or uh, an inflated ego, but at the same time, a very kind of torn apart ego feeling like, I feel like all of those emotions that he's developing out of his characters or finding in historical characters are very much reflections back on himself. And it's, I mean, it's a bigger debate how much we want to tie any piece of work back to the sort of subjectivity or identity of the maker, him or herself. Um, I think that in the case of Ethan's, especially how he's talked about it, that relationship is actually quite close. Um, that the, 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 idea, the characters that he's developing are in some ways distorted like a funhouse mirror um, of his own self. So I think in this series, you know, these, I think in this series, these characters are both about the own personality of the character, but maybe also about what these characters might be capable of or what they've done. So the way that a character can then open up and, and gesture to a much kind of larger scene to me, it seems to be at work in these narratives, especially since it's called world myths. The idea that one character might embody an entire myth. Uh, what might that myth be about? But I think the self-reflexive question is, uh, I think it's very apt, and I feel like it's it's really prevalent in all of the work. I, think. Well, I, I see in these a set of reveal and conceal mm -hmm. simultaneously in these extremely wonderful figures of language. Yeah, I think that's a very, very good point. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. I, I find it really interesting that in some of these pictures, especially within the landscapes, that he's either perched or balanced or he's falling mm. into it. I find that it very uh, interesting. Yeah. I think we live in a crazy world, and I think, you know, it's kind of weird that he does that juxtapose. I think that kind of has something to do with it. I think you're right. And I think that Ethan has talked about from a very young age being fascinated by flight. <laughs> and he has these crazy stories of growing up in Vermont and jumping off things that I never wanted to jump off of. And, you know, and always kind of having this idea of the excitement of getting airborne. And I think that what comes with that is the fall. And um, so, like that early Pinto Brothers series, you know, it's it's all about this dream of getting airborne, and I think then you can see that following through, um, as you said, like here and you know, pose right on this edge, both to get high, but then what's you know, one has to reckon with the fall. This is one of the ways that you can set that. Yeah. Do you have any insights on uh, his thoughts on contemporary art, like where he's, he's doing this directly on the wall, so they're essentially going to be gone? Mm -hmm. Ethan, so Ethan teaches at the museum school in Boston. So he teaches, he uh, teaches, painting. He teaches painting, and I know that he's, you know, as part of his teaching in art school, he's very engaged with Look at contemporary art, consume contemporary art, he keeps, you know, he keeps up with it. I think the wall drawing for him, uh, he did the first one, I believe, in 2010 at the Winston Watcher Gallery in New York. And I think he saw it first in the challenge. 
he's the artist when I've asked him who has inspired him, he's the artist that you can have said to me for another I'm always 
from before we and I just want to know that my guys that we have from these brochures, they list, uh, they're on the table on the way out, they have a list of our upcoming programs, and um, Ruth was talking about uh, the film screening we're having, and that is October 26th, from 5 to 7. We're going to be showing those in our planetary, the Electric Sky Theater. As far as I know, I think that's the first time we're going to be showing any art in the planetarium, so pretty excited about that. Let's see how that goes. Um, and that week before that event, he'll be back here reworking some of these wall drawings, and the folks are welcome to come and uh, watch my work as well. So if you don't know where you got one, grab one, and uh, we hope to see you again. And don't miss that dust line. <laughs> yes, it's amazing. Oh, we were really? testing it out the um, past couple of weeks to see how it goes. The sound system in that place is amazing, so the dynamite all explodes. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. <laughs> and Ethan will be talking about each film as we show them. So, love you. Thank you for Well, thanks so much, Ruth. Thank you.